So during this video presentation, we're going to look at the connections within the 17th edition Amendment 3 Consumers Unit, mm -hmm. best practice to lay out conductors, yep. and the identification of those conductors. Sure. We know as we're developing into the 18th edition, we're going to see things like RCBOs become commonplace, mm -hmm. as well as the introduction of what? As well as looking at the introduction of surge protection devices. Now this is something that it's not a controversial area of the regs and it's not a new area of the regs, but it's something that's developing, isn't it? And I think particularly industry is developing its understanding of surge protection, where and when it's to be used, uh, when you don't need to use it, how, when you can avoid using it. Yeah. So it's an interesting kind of area under development and you can guarantee there'll be lots more information on this coming through. So we're just gonna have a very brief chat about that as we uh, move through the video. And we're seeing that they're calling them 18th edition mm. distribution boards or yeah. consumers units now, where they're actually looking to integrate those in, even sure. though we know in a domestic dwelling they can be avoided. Yeah. So we're gonna bring the camera in, we're gonna take the consumer unit cover off, we're gonna talk about the sticker that's on the front of it, mm -hmm. and we're gonna look at the layout of these conductors in relationship to the circuit breakers and RCDs within the consumer unit. So Joe, the camera's in nice and close. Before we actually take the consumer unit cover off and have a look at what's going on inside there, we have got one of the stickers we expect to see on the front of the consumer unit. We're gonna show a later video with the stickers expected on the consumer's unit. Can you just explain what's changed about this sticker? Yeah, so this is the sticker indicating to uh, the property owner or the, uh, the dweller that it's very important that they check that the RCD is operating by pushing the test button on the RCD here on a regular basis. Now, the label actually indicates a, a bit of a significant change under the 18th edition. So we've gone from testing quarterly, as we were under previous editions, so every three months, to now we're instructing uh, the homeowner or the, uh, the uh, property manager that they need to test six monthly. So we've gone from every three months to every six months. So that's a, a small but significant change that's occurred in the 18th edition. And from our learner's point of view, that's often an exam question, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So it's worth knowing at this point that that is the case. So then, Joe, we're going to look to get inside this electrical enclosure. We can clearly see the tails are not connected to the supply because this is a mimicked installation. However, we're still going to approach it as if it was an energised installation when we're going in to have a look at it. So as we open up the consumer unit lid to expose uh, the circuit breakers, RCDs, and the main switch. So this is a linked main switch or double pole switch. What's the process we're gonna go through before we actually operate the switch for means of isolation? Yeah, so what we wanna take care of here is uh, we need to acknowledge that this uh, main isolator is not really designed to be operated under load. In other words, if we had a lot of current flowing through this isolator, we wouldn't necessarily wanna go straight to that there. Uh, as it can cause arcing and other issues. So the kind of preferred method for isolating a consumer unit that's under load is to go to each one of the individual circuit breakers and to turn them off one by one before we isolate the main switch. So do you want to demonstrate that for us, Gaz? Yeah, so we were knocking off individual circuit breakers. We'll be then knocking off the RCD, circuit breakers, and then the RCD. And then we'd do what, Joe? And now we've got to this point, we've disconnected all the load from the consumer unit. So at this point, we can now operate the main switch and that could be safely isolated and we can remove the lid and get to work. Same process applies when the there is a separate uh, isolating switch within the towers itself. We'd still go through the same process when we'd operate the circuit breakers, RCDs, this switch, and then obviously the remote switch as well. Absolutely. One more point just to watch out for is that once we've isolated this once we've turned it off. Of course, it's very easy for someone to come and switch this back on again. So we'd wanna make sure that we locked this out, put a tag on it instructing what was happening uh, so that no one came and switched that on accidentally. Remembering this video is all about the layout of the inside of the consumer unit, the position of circuit breakers, and not necessarily a safe isolation video. And you can see that in other presentations that we have produced. So Joe, in this mimicked installation, we need to get inside the electrical enclosure, and yep. it states an electrical enclosure needs to be entered by what means? So it can only be entered by means of a tool or a key, and so in this case, we're using a, a posi screwdriver to remove the fixing screws. Once those are undone, that can then be slid off the front there. Well, Joe, we've got a lot going on in this consumer's unit, and I'd like to think at this point, anyone watching the video who's a DIY home enthusiast, he would understand or she would understand that this is the stage where an electrician, somebody of competence, is actually going to be working, and we wouldn't be dibbling around in here as a domestic uh, household owner. 
Mm, absolutely, yeah, there's uh, a lot of stuff going on here. It's easy to make a mistake to get something put back in the wrong place, which can not only cause malfunction of equipment, but could also cause injury or even death. So uh, this is the stage where, uh, yeah, once we're looking at this, we need a proper qualified electrician in the building. Okay then, Joe, from a learner standpoint now, we're gonna go through what we've got laid out here, coming up with some of the key areas and key things to remember as they go through their training and move towards being an electrician in the electrical industry. So first of all, we've stated this is the main isolation switch, often called a double pole switch or a linked main switch. Mm -hmm. Can you explain which conductors that is isolating for me, Joe? Yeah, so if we look in the top of the switch here, you can see that we've got an incoming line and an incoming neutral. Now these are both classed as live conductors, which means that when we operate this main switch here, we're breaking both the line and the neutral coming into the installation. So now, all of the conductors, all of the live conductors, all of the neutrals are all disconnected from the incoming line and neutral. So Joe, we've got two RCDs in circuit here and they are AC type RCDs and we're going to produce a video later on about the limitations mm. in the modern world of an AC RCD. Which type of RCDs are we really looking to move towards? We're now looking to move towards type A RCDs. Uh, there's numerous reasons for that and again like Gary says we're going to get into that in a slightly different uh, video, a more technical video. But it's worth starting to note because this is something that perhaps we've not thought about very much before. This little symbol here that shows us a sine wave, the AC waveform, that little symbol will change from uh, device to device and we need to start familiarising ourselves with what that means. So just keep a watch out for a future video covering that material. We've discussed at length on other videos and with our learners that the RCD is offering additional protection. To offer additional protection, the RCD rating must be rated at 30 milliamps or below. The actual rated value of the switching mechanism within the RCD is 80 amps. For our learners, we're concentrating on this 30 milliamps and below in order to offer additional protection, and both RCDs are rated the same at 30 milliamps. Can you explain why we've got two, Joe? Yeah, so what we're looking at here is this, this is a sort of a more 17th edition kind of compliant board going back a little way. Um, when RCD protection became something that was a more stringent requirement, uh, especially in domestic installations, um, there was an issue brought up with if we just have one RCD protecting all circuits, we run into a real problem with what used to be called discrimination. Under the 18th, this is now called selectivity. The idea being that if we get a fault on one circuit, that one fault on that one circuit should only trip and isolate the circuit that the fault is on. Now, at the minute, we've got a situation, if we only had one RCD covering the whole installation, a fault on any one of these circuits would disconnect everything. Now, obviously, that would lead to uh, poor selectivity, and it would mean that the entire property could be plunged into darkness, no electricity, uh, because of a fault on one circuit. Now, what we've got here is kind of a halfway solution because we've got an RCD covering half of the circuits in the property and an RCD covering the other half of the circuits in the property. And there's something significant actually, and, and this again is it's quite a nice subtle point here, but quite a kind of important one that again separates, you know, sort of uh, the professionals out from the amateurs really. Because how are these circuits arranged across these two RCDs, guys? So Joe, what we end up doing is mixing and matching the locations of circuits across RCDs. So we've got an RCD here and we're mimicking circuits and we've got an RCD here and we're mimicking circuits. So if circuit here, number one, was mimicked to be an upstairs ring final circuit, we wouldn't want when this RCD to goes off to turn off both the upstairs sockets and say the upstairs lighting. Mm. So we're gonna position the upstairs lighting, not here, we're gonna have these as the downstairs lighting against maybe the upstairs sockets, and we swap the process when we come over here. So what we find now, that this is possibly now the downstairs ring final circuit, and this would be mimicked, say, as the upstairs lighting circuit. So in the event of losing one RCD, you get the residual lighting from maybe table lamps, TVs, etc. when you lose main lighting, and the opposite way around when we lose it in a different area. Yeah, and obviously this is not a perfect solution to the issue of what we now call selectivity, because, you know, we've not got perhaps two showers in the property, we've not perhaps got two cookers in the property. However, it's kind of a, a halfway house solution, isn't it? So it's not too bad, but obviously we're constantly seeking to improve installations, we're constantly seeking to improve the industry. So what really would be the absolute ideal solution in this instance, Gaz? Is to have 
not RCDs protecting multiple circuits, but to have RCBOs. And this is the larger version. We know the miniaturized, and it's also a C type, probably not uh, applicable for a domestic dwelling. It's just one I've just pulled out of the cupboard. But if we move towards RCBOs, in the event of it causing a fault on one circuit, say to earth, we're just gonna isolate just this one circuit. We have got more test uh, buttons to press, so under the 18th edition, we know, Joe, we're gonna be doing what with those? Uh, we're gonna be testing those every six months, as I believe we mentioned earlier. <laughs> we are. So Joe, let's have a look at some of the rated values in amperes of the overcurrent protection devices and sure. relate it to the type of circuits we're mimicking here in the installation. So yeah. as we just said there, this is 32 amp type B. Mm -hmm. All the breakers in this distribution board are type B. Uh, the type is matched against the inrush style of currents given by the loads. And yep. we know with things, give us an example of some things that may alter the type of breaker that we're gonna use. Yeah, as homes become more and more modernized and we get more and more equipment being installed in there, we, we might occasionally have inrush issues with uh, things like um, air conditioning units. Um, if you had a lot of LED lamps of specific types, you might get a bit of inrush current there. So we'll release a video in a, a later date that describe BCD type differences uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, but it's all to do with basically the type of load we've got connected. Now generally, in a, a typical domestic dwelling, a B type will generally be okay, but it must be matched against the type of load that's going to be installed. That's a fantastic piece of information, Joe. Again, mimicked installation for yeah. us. So 32 amp type B breaker with mimicked a ring final circuit, mm -hmm. but we've also labeled the conductors with the number ones. Yep. And by the looks of things, now we've got two neutral bars here, Joe. Um, any reason why we've got two? Yep, so we've got two neutral bars because we've got two separate RCDs. So again, very briefly, uh, we've covered this in a, a different video, but an RCD works by monitoring the current flowing uh, down the line and back down the neutral. And as long as it seems this sees the same current in both, it's happy. So we need to have a separate, ne separate neutral bar for each of the RCDs. So this one relates to this neutral bar, this RCD relates to this neutral bar, because if we connected these all onto the same neutral bar, the RCDs would be constantly tripping out. And just going back to the numbers, as Gaz was saying, we can clearly see there's a relationship here. So we've got this one labeled up with number one. So where do we find, uh, what else do we find labeled up with those number ones? There so we've got the neutrals described here, but also the circuit protective conductors in the earth bar. Sure. So when we're taking out circuits or working on circuits, it helps us identify the circuits that we're actually working on. Yeah, absolutely. Now as we work our way down here, guys, okay, it's, it's of note to see that there's actually a gap here where there's no circuit installed. So why have we got a circuit breaker installed there when there's no circuit coming out of it? This was practice given to us by Luke Wichard. Yeah. What we tend to do is have blanking plates put into distribution boards, consumers units. However, what he said his practice was to actually give yourself an opportunity in the future to go back either to use a circuit breaker that was already there at the right ampere rating or to remove it and jiggle those around. Now let's just make it very clear now before we get comments. This is not a requirement by the regulations. This is just something that's been demonstrated to us that we quite like the idea of. Obviously there's downsides, you've got the added expense of a couple of breakers, uh, but actually this creates uh, a much kind of more thorough installation. We think this is a, quite a good practice to get involved in. So not a requirement, but again, it's something that we quite like and, and we'd probably put into practice if we were uh, on site, wouldn't we guys? We absolutely would. Another thing to note is that from the main switch working away, and from each RCD, mm. that we tend to go for best practice, again, not a regulation, to go from largest to smallest. So we've gone 32 amp ring final circuit, a breaker not being used. Mm -hmm. Then we've got a breaker rated at 20 amps, again at type B, with a 2.5 mil cable, number three, number three, number three. And then we go six amp and six amp for two probably lighting circuits being mimicked here. So we went down 32, 32, 20, six and six. Mm -hmm in descending order. Yeah, and the reason for that really uh, is so that uh, the largest amount of current runs across the least part of the disboard uh, of the buzz bar down here. Now again, this isn't a regulation, it's not a requirement. This buzz bar uh, is rated to take uh, the current that we're running through it. But again, it's just standard practice, good practice to do this, so that the largest amount of current which is running through the larger breakers, generally speaking, will flow through the shortest amount of buzz bar before it exits into the RCD there. 
It's a very good point, Joe. And we've got exactly the same here in this half of the Mimic installation. We go um, 40 amps, 32, 32, a 16 not being used, and a six. So again, mm -hmm. we've come down in order of size of circuit breakers. Yep. Uh, we've got some issues here. Probably we couldn't find the right size number for this yep. one. This should have been numbered six, okay? I don't think it's a big issue when it's a 10 mil cable. I don't think we're gonna get confused no. with it if we were removing it. And then we go seven, eight, nine's not been used, and 10, and we've replicated it on both the CPCs and noting that we've now moved to the different neutral mm. bar here, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. So Joe, we've already talked about some of the things that's making a consumer's unit evolve over time, whether it be moving away from AC RCDs to maybe A types um, RCDs in the future. We're also seeing in the early stage of the 18th edition, the actual in domestic dwellings where we're considering it might not be required in single dwellings, that SPDs are now appearing in the consumer's unit as increased best practice. Do you want to show us what that would look like? Yeah, so surge protection, as you say, is one of those areas that the industry is kind of still coming to grips to. It's by no means new technology. This has uh, been around uh, for a long time, but it's something that uh, the electrical industry at large is, is still sort of getting used to under the 18th edition. Um, like Gary says, while there's not necessarily a requirement in place uh, just yet for a single domestic dwelling. When you look at the cost of surge protection against the cost of all your electrical equipment in your house, uh, you know there's, there's no contest really in terms of uh, the, the cost implications for providing this protection. And we're starting to see now that manufacturers are actually starting to install surge protection devices into consumer units as kind of a, a, a standardized practice moving forward. So actually we might get to the point where we kind of just buy a consumer unit and they say, do you want surge protection for an extra X amount of pounds? Well, yeah, let's just put it in there. And we're seeing the SPD perhaps being inserted in, so into the consumer's yeah. unit, followed by a row of miniature RCBOs is yeah. the practice that we're yeah. looking at at the Absolutely. moment. Absolutely, yeah. So that's just a little run through of what we expect to see within a consumer's unit, probably highlighting some best practices as well. But as we move into the 18th edition and deeper into it, and we evolve what a consumer unit looks like in domestic dwellings, we're gonna see some radical changes over time. Do you agree with that, Joe? Absolutely, yeah. And it's one of those things, you know, um, we started off with, you know, sort of fuse links, fuse wires, and that was replaced by sort of cartridge fuses. And then as time went on, we got MCBs, and now we've got RCDs, RCBOs. It's, it's just the natural progression of our industry. And really, it's something we should be embracing uh, because it's all about that, that constant striving for improvement, uh, for professionalism, and for safety as well, for you know the safety standards in our properties. We want to make sure that we're leaving a property safe and sound so that customers don't get hurt by our work. And before we exit this video, I'd like to reiterate, this is the area and domain of that qualified electrician, mm. and they should be the people poking around Absolutely. and making the uh, adjustments required in electrical installation. We've also got a separate video where we talk about the torque settings. Okay, and setting up our torque screwdriver as well. So yep. feel free to check that one out as well. So Joe, that's looking at some of the best practices that we can have for laying out conductors within a consumer's unit. Yep. And we're looking at perhaps going over to RCBOs, moving yep. away from RCDs. Mm -hmm. And you also suggested that we're looking to put in. Yep, some uh, surge protection devices. So we've got an example of one of these here. And we can see that shift now, can't we? We're, we're pulling away from the 17th edition amendment three of the regs. And now we're looking at the 18th edition and we're looking at the changes that will start to take place within consumer units like this one and perhaps on a larger scale in more industrial settings as well. So Joe? Should we do it? Yeah. We, we hope, hope this video has been some help.